Okay, so we're going to continue with chapter 3. Um, we just finished talking about all of the different parts of the cell and all of the cell organelles. Now we're going to look at how our cell interacts within its extracellular environment. So let's go over some solution terminology. A solute is the substance dissolved within the fluid. The solvent is what is doing the dissolving. So when you mix your sugar in your coffee, your coffee is the solvent and the solute is the sugar. The concentration is the overall amount of solute that's dissolved in a given amount of solvent. And the concentration gradient is the difference in concentration between two areas. Um, for instance, um, if there is uh, a heater in one room and a, no heater in another room, the room that has the heater has a high concentration of heat and the, the room without a heater has a low concentration of heat that's going to cause a concentration gradient or a difference in concentration of heat. That's a poor example because really we're talking about molecules. Heat is a form of energy. Uh, it's not a molecule. Let's talk about diffusion. When we're talking about concentration gradients we have to use the D word, diffusion. Diffusion is the process by solutes moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Molecules want to go from a more crowded area to a less, con uh, less crowded area. This is called movement down a concentration gradient. When I used to teach middle school, I used to demonstrate this concept by pushing, not literally, but kind of gathering up all of my students into one corner of the room and telling them to be uh, as still as possible. And they did pretty good for about 45 seconds until you know, one would get a little squirmy and then one would squ would sneeze, etc. And then after about five minutes, they would start diffusing throughout the room and, and becoming less concentrated in that corner. That was to demonstrate the idea of moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. Spring perfume using air fresheners is another example of that. Those air fresheners go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration as they diffuse throughout the room. Solutes are usually ions. In this case, most of the time we're talking about sugars, fatty acids, gases, when we're talking about cells. There's a type of kinetic energy that's driving diffusion, and diffusion is usually a, pa it is a passive process by nature. There's no energy that's needed to drive the reaction. You can put energy in to make the reaction go faster, but for the most part, diffusion is passive. It's going to naturally occur if you spray that air freshener over time the people that are far away from you are going to be smelling that air freshener. Uh, it just might take longer um, than the people that are sitting right next to you. Here's an example. This example uh, is using what's called a selectively permeable membrane. Your cell membrane, you may recall, is a selectively permeable membrane. It acts like a bouncer, only letting certain materials through. So in this case, we have a high concentration of ions on one side. These are dye molecules and on the other side there is no dye molecule, so there's a zero concentration. Molecules always go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, in other words, down the concentration gradient, and that's what you see here in this picture. Notice the movement of these molecules. Some of them are going to go back through the membrane. It's not unidirectional. This selectively permeable membrane will allow those molecules to go in either direction. However, the net movement is driving the molecules from this side to this side. Some of them are going to trickle back across, but overall, more of them are coming over to the less concentrated side. At equilibrium, that's ultimately what diffusion is trying to accomplish, the state of equilibrium where there are equal concentrations on either side of the selectively permeable membrane. In this case, we have net movement. Uh, in no direction. There's equal amounts of movement on both sides of our selectively permeable membrane. Diffusion conditions uh, that have to be present. Of course, the membrane has to be permeable to the solute. It has to let the solute cross. There has to be a concentration gradient to, to drive the, the net movement of those solutes across the membrane. And as I mentioned, that diffusion will occur until equilibrium is reached and the solute concentration is equal on both sides of the membrane. Let's talk about some transport proteins. If the solute is lipid soluble, it will pass directly through that cell membrane. If a substance is larger than lipids in the membrane, 
then it's going to need a transport protein. It can use channels and pores, as we saw those integral proteins. Some of them act as a channel, basically staying open and allowing these lipid-soluble molecules to flow right on through. They act as a tunnel. They can be gated uh, to only allow movement under certain conditions, or they can be um, what we call leaky, which would just uh, be constantly opening. Uh, they could also be a carrier protein, where a solute has to bind to the outer surface of that protein molecule, inducing a shape change, and then that solute can be released to the inside part of the cell. Facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport is diffusion that's aided by a transport protein. The solute's still moving down the concentration gradient. It's still going from high to low concentration. No additional energy is needed. It's still a passive process. It just requires a transport protein because of the solubility or the size of the molecule. Here you can see what I was talking about, our concentration gradient. We have a higher concentration of whatever lipid-soluble molecule outside of the cell through simple diffusion. Those molecules are just going to diffuse straight through that cell membrane. In facilitated diffusion, our molecules, in this case potassium, may use a channel protein. Potassium is an ion. Ions have a charge on them. Our cell membrane doesn't like to let charged molecules through because this inner part where all of those phospholipid tails are is a hydrophobic region. It doesn't like these charged ions. So those charged ions are going to go through a nuclear, uh, or rather through a, a channel protein, which acts as a pore, letting the potassium go in or out as needed. Facilitated diffusion, again, is still a passive process, uh, but it needs the help of a channel protein. Facilitated diffusion can also use a carrier protein, in this case glucose. Glucose wants to come into the cell, so it binds to the glucose carrier molecule. That's going to cause a conformational change within the carrier protein, allowing that glucose to be transported into the cell. Osmosis is a special type of diffusion. This is the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane. Solutes can't travel down their concentration gradient in this case. Water has to travel down the concentration gradient. So it's kind of backwards from our thinking. Water is going to move from a more dilute area to a more concentrated area of solute. It's still going from a high concentration to a low concentration. It's just the concentration of water that we're looking at, not the concentration of the solute that we're looking at in this case. Let's see if I can do a quick drawing using my whiteboard, which I'm pretty terrible at, but we'll try it anyway. Here we have a beaker of water, and here is a cell inside that beaker of water. Most cells have a solute concentration of 3% inside of them. And let's put this cell in a 0% solution. 0% solution, here's our 3% cell. Now these percentages are representing the percentages of solutes. This is a 0% solute concentration, but it's a 100% water concentration. This is a 3% solute concentration, but it's a 97% water concentration. So in this case, if water is the, the molecule that's moving, water is going to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. In other words, from where it is 100% to where it is 97%. You can also think of it as water moves to where there's more stuff. In this case, water is going to go into our cell. It's going from an area of high concentration in that 0% solute solution to that 3% solute solution. If we had another case, let's draw the opposite. There's our beaker of water. Here's our cell, still at 3%. But let's put our cell in a 20% glucose solution. If our cell is in a 20% glucose solution, that's really an 80% water solution and our cell still has a 97% water solution inside of it. So in this case, water is going to leave the cell. 
there are special terms that we give these solutions. In this case, since water was going into our cell, the solution, this 0% solute solution that our cell is sitting in, is called a hypotonic solution. Sorry, again, I'm using a touchpad. Uh, in this case, since water is leaving our cell, there's a higher solute concentration outside of the cell. This solution, this 20% glucose solution, is called hypertonic. Sorry, I know it looks like a three-year-old is writing this. There we go. Um, I remember these terms because in a hypotonic solution, think about what's going to happen to this cell. It's going to continue to gain water and it's going to blow up like an O. An O is nice and big and round and that's exactly what our cell is going to look like after sitting in this hypotonic solution. It in fact may even burst. In a hypertonic solution, the water is hyper and wants to leave the cell. It wants to go outside and play. Think of a hyper two-year-old, right? Wants to go outside and play. That's exactly what the water is doing in a hypertonic solution. Let's get back to our vocabulary here. This is a diagram showing you exactly what I was just uh, talking about. Oops. Sorry, my mouse likes to jump around. In this case, we have uh, the start of an experiment where we have lots of sucrose molecules inside of our cell, lots of water molecules outside of our cell, and these molecules are going to move until equilibrium is reached. In this case, since there's lots of sucrose molecules inside of our cell and no sucrose outside of our cell, water, which is always easier to move, is going to go into this test tube, which in this case is representing a cell. So this is what we call a hypotonic solution. At equilibrium, there's equal movements of water into and out of that test tube. And look at what, what's happening through this glass tube. It's actually increasing the water concentration in this tube, which is forcing the, the solution to come up and out of the tube. Some terminology. I already introduced the terms hypotonic and hypertonic to you. Isotonic would be a solution that is at equilibrium. So let's look at them more specifically. The term isotonic. Iso means the same. Tonic is referring to osmotic pressure, like inside the cell. It's the pressure to move water inside the cell. The solute concentration is the same inside and outside the cell. So we say that our cell is at equilibrium. There's no net movement of water. However, there is movement of water into and out of the cell in equal in increments. In a hypotonic solution, the term hypo means less than. So this is when the osmotic pressure is less than the inside of the cell. This is causing the extracellular con uh, solute concentration to be less than inside the cell. So water is going to go into the cell, as I mentioned. This causes the cell to swell and possibly lice. In a hypertonic solution, hyper means more than. So in this case, the osmotic pressure is more than inside the cell. Our extracellular solute concentration is more than inside the cell. So water is going to leave the cell. Water is hyper and wants to leave the cell. In this case, let's look at what happens in our human body in isotonic solution. Our red blood cells are nice and donut shaped. This is why when you go um, to the doctors and you're dehydrated, what do they give you? Do they give you distilled water? No. They're going to give you a saline solution. A saline solution is an isotonic solution, so your red blood cells maintain their shape. If they were to give you distilled water, this is what would be created. Your red blood cells would undergo what's called hemolysis. They would literally swell and then eventually rupture because that's a hypotonic solution and that causes an influx of water into the cell. This is also what happens if you overhydrate. Overhydrating by just drinking water on a sweaty on a day that you're sweating a lot, you're losing a lot of solutes, losing a lot of water. If you only replace the water and not the solutes, um, you can create a hypotonic solution in your blood. And this is what's called water poisoning. This is why some people have actually died from drinking too much water on those hot days. A hypertonic solution, this is what happens when you become dehydrated.
when your water concentration is depleted um, and your solute concentration is in increased, the uh, our blood cells are going to begin to lose water to the external environment, and our red blood cells become what we call prenated. They shrivel up and they become very spiky in appearance. Let's <clears throat> So far, excuse me, so far we've been talking about passive transport through simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. Active transport is the process that's going to use energy to move molecules. These can be pumps, exchangers, or transporters. Ultimately, this is moving solutes from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. We say that it's moving things against the concentration gradient or up to the concentration gradient. So a pump would be like the uh, sodium-potassium pump. It's going to use ATP to, um, to uh, derive the energy to pump these molecules across. In this case, sodium wants to come into the cell and potassium wants to leave the cell. But in the instance of the sodium-potassium pump, sodium is pumped out of the cell where it is in higher concentration and potassium is pumped into the cell where it is in higher concentration. So sodium and potassium are pumped against their concentration gradients in opposite directions using the sodium-potassium pump. Exchangers movement move against the concentration gradient and that's coupling with a second substance. Um, so the sodium-calcium exchanger is an example of this. There's also electrically coupled transporters. This is where the movement occurs against the concentration gradient by coupling electron movements with the membrane. Uh, electron movement is going to, uh, or rather one example of this, is when the mitochondrial cristae allowing, allows for the transport of proteins out of the mitochondrial matrix. This is going to drive the formation of lots of ATP through the um, process of oxidative phosphorylation. There's also endocytosis. This is a, an alternate form of active transport. Instead of using lots of energy to pump molecules against their concentration gradient. This is using energy just to pump large amounts of molecules or large molecules themselves. It's transporting large substances and it's using those vesicles. We mentioned vesicles when we were talking about the Golgi apparatus. Those are those little bubbles that can fuse with the cell membrane. The vesicle is formed by an infolding of that plasma membrane around the substance which is going to bud off and then possibly fuse with the lysosome to be digested. Examples of this are phagocytosis, which is bringing in solid substances, pinocytosis, which is bringing in liquid agents, and then receptor-mediated endocytosis, which is endocytosis on a specific receptor region of the plasma membrane. Phagocytosis, as I mentioned, this is bringing in large particles such as bacteria or viruses. This is also called cell eating. The plasma membrane literally forms these false feet called pseudopods that enclose and envelop um, what's called a phagosome. It's called a phagosome at this point. It's going to fuse with lysosomes to allow for the digestion of those materials which were just engulfed. Here you can see what I was, me was, what I was talking about, these pseudopods kind of swelling out from the plasma membrane, engulfing some type of pathogen, in this case a microbe, coming into a vesicle fusing with a lysosome. The lysosome can then digest the particle and has lots of uh, digested pieces inside of it. This lysosome can then fuse again with the cell membrane to undergo what's called exocytosis, which is the opposite of endocytosis. It's going to be getting rid of all of those waste products. Pinocytosis is cell drinking, bringing in droplets of extracellular fluid. As the solutes are dissolved within the fluid, uh, vesicles um, will bring those substances in. Those vesicles can fuse with lysosomes and release their contents just like in phagocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is when hormones bind to receptors on the plasma membrane, resulting in a hormone receptor complex. The vesicle can then fuse with the lysosome and the hormone receptor complex, complex is then broken down. New receptors are made and packaged and then fused with the plasma membrane to reestablish that receptor site. If the hormones, uh, if, if that cell is exposed to hormones repeatedly or over a long period of time, there's fewer receptors available, and so your body becomes desensitized or that target tissue 
becomes desensitized, has, which has a loss of effect of that hormone, meaning the cell will start to ignore, uh, for lack of a better term, what that hormone is secreting. Exocytosis is that reverse process of endocytosis. This is transporting substances out of the cell, the vesicles that bud off of the Golgi complex, carrying those proteins or whatever waste products, merging with that plasma membrane, releasing contents to the outside of the cell. Neurotransmitters, endocrine hormones, digestive hormones, etc. are all secreted in this fashion. Receptors and enzymes are inserted into those vesicle surfaces, so when that vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, the receptors are already incorporated in the plasma membrane surface. Here you can see the whole uh, pathway, endocytosis, the cell engulfing, whatever substance this is, packaging it, fusing with a lysosome, forming a secondary lysosome, and causing those particles to be able to be recycled inside the cell. Here we have the Golgi repackaging things that are coming from the endoplasmic reticulum, possibly proteins, forming little transport vesicles or secretory vesicles, fusing with that plasma membrane, and then undergoing exocytosis to be released to the extracellular fluid. This video here shows you um, a little bit about transport across the plasma membrane. We'll stop here for part two.